Hello and welcome everyone to our South Malaysia Legal Webinar Special Series, Episode 3. Currently, currently, yes, currently yes. it is 2.30 p.m. So good afternoon to all of you, wherever you are from. And this is our third episode and we have reached the maximum capacity. Hence, the, today's webinar is also available on our South Malaysia FB uh, Facebook page. And we thank you for your for your support for aiding us in reaching this amazing milestone. So my name is David Lee, and I'm the Secretary General of the Alsa Malaysia. And I also I will be your moderator today. And we would first like to extend our gratitude to our esteemed speaker, Mr. Sarawana Kuma, for his time today. And this webinar is brought to you by Alsa Malaysia, collaborating with Ross Lee Darren Sarawana Partnership. As law pursuing students, tax law is seldom being taught in law school. And this subject has been a mysterious part of our pathway in reading the laws. So today, with the presence of our tax law expert, Mr. Sarvana, our South Malaysia believes that these sessions will definitely benefit us all in achieving the clarities on the comprehensive understanding of Malaysian tax law and to gain an insight from practical scenarios and real life ex examples. And before we start, let me give you an introduction of our speaker today, Mr. Sarvana. Mr. Saurana is well known to be very committed, admirable, and have a deep knowledge and experiences on Malaysian tax law. And out of his so many remarkable achievements, he was recently named as one of the 40 leading lawyers under the 40 in Asia by Asian legal business. And at the same time, he was also named as the one of the top 100 lawyers in Malaysia by Asia Business Law Journal. So, without further ado, we will get the ball rolling. And the topic today is key principles of Malaysian tax law. We once again thank Mr. Saravana and let us welcome his presentation today. Mr. Saravana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. A very good afternoon to all uh, the listeners and especially law students who are aspiring to read law and practice uh, eventually tax law. A uh, very warm welcome. And for those or those of my Muslim friends who are fasting, uh, Salamat Purpasa. And uh, and for those who are uh, what you call um, uh, listening, will also be wondering why am I sitting inside a car? Because I am indeed in a car. Uh, I finished a meeting in Putrajaya a moment ago, and uh, and I thought I could reach my destination before the the webinar. But I think uh, MCO means you still have to obey traffic laws. So I thought I will do the call in, in, in the car uh, rather than, you know, uh, delaying everyone. And uh, and be assured, my movement in MCO uh, is a bit authority uh, from the from the authorities because I am I'm asked to advise uh, on certain matters of the law. Uh, uh, hence why I need to travel to Putrajaya today. So I will, I'm asked by Alsa to share my thoughts on Malaysian tax law in one hour. And this one hour includes QE. And we will try our best simply because, my friends, you'll, you require one whole semester to read tax law. Uh, but yeah, I'm given one hour to achieve that. So I then decided that we can do it. Nothing is impossible. And I have highlighted the key aspects of tax law so that everyone gets an idea uh, how tax law works. So the slides are being uh, will be shown to you on the screen. I must first apologize because the slide number will all be number two. That is because that's me doing slides, and that shows how how my skills in numbering are not so good. Yeah. Now, if I may ask Lukman to go to the first slide, uh, I want to start by explaining to my to the listeners uh, what are the basic principles of tax law. Yeah, and there are four principles I want to share in, in this occasion. Yeah, number one, principles of strict interpretation of the law, whereby texting statute is to be read strictly. You look at the word in the statute strictly, read it using plain ordinary English, nothing to be intended, nothing to be implied. You cannot assume things for text law. If the word is ABC, the word shall be ABC. 
you cannot intend it to include D, E, and F. Then the next question in a very in the mind of a very good law student would be, Sarah, you, how about purposive approach? Of course, we also use purposive approach. Section 17A of the Interpretation Act uh, also apply for taxing statute. But you know very well, under the rules of interpretation, you do not go into purposive approach immediately. You will first start with literal, appro literal approach first. You only depart from literal, literal approach if literal reading of the law results in an absurd meaning or it is contrary to the intention of parliament. And for all those things, you have various circumstances. Uh, is it an amending provision? Is it an amending act uh, for you to depart from literal reading and to move into a purposive approach? But the basic principle in tax law is strict interpretation. And if you're looking at a case law to go and read, please go and read the case of uh, premium vegetable against the palm oil research board, the federal court decision, where Justice Gopal Sriram uh, uh, relied on the English case of Mangin, M-A-N-G-I-N, in highlighting how you apply the doctrine of interpretation uh, when it comes to reading taxing statutes. So that is for law students to get an idea how to read tax law. When you read the act, how, what are the philosophies or the jurisprudence when it comes to interpretation? But let's jump into the key technical issues. What is taxable income? In Malaysia, you only pay in tax on income. And that income must be earned in Malaysia. The tax language is accrued in derived from Malaysia. So what does that mean? If you are being employed, if during this MCO, you become a Grab uh, driver or a Grab food uh, delivery boy or girl, during this period, the money you earn is still income. You got to pay tax on it. But if you get the government uh, subsidy or the government assistance during MCO, is that your income? Food for thought, yeah? Uh, so you have now decide, is that taxable or not? If I tell you it's taxable, you won't be so happy. But I got good news for you. Such handouts from the government, such assistance from the government is not income. Because for a particular money to become income, it must have certain characters. Certain characters that make it income within the six classes of income in Malaysia. Section 4 of the Income Tax Act provides for six classes of income. And the more common classes of income would be A, subsection A, business income, and B, employment income. So if you are employed on a part-time basis, you receive employment income, then that income would be a taxable income under paragraph B. But we are one of the lucky countries in the world because we don't have to pay tax on all the income that we earn. You only pay tax on your income if you reach the chargeable threshold. So as an average rule in Malaysia, uh, you need to earn about 30,000 plus ringgit a year to be subject to income tax. Otherwise, you don't have to pay income tax in Malaysia. And if you're earning below the, the average income, uh, if you're earning two, two and a half thousand ringgit a month, that you're not even required to pay tax, yet alone file tax return in this country. So that is taxable income in a very general concept. But assuming you now receive payment uh, in the period of MCO, you're a businessman and or your family members run a business and they come and tell you, uh, son or daughter, listen, we now I'm going to receive some payment because the person, the contractor who's supposed to do a job because of MCO, he can't complete the project. He has delayed uh, and therefore I can't start my business. I will lose some money. Uh, they're going to pay me some money to compensate me for loss of my income. Is it taxable? What do you think? Or you are trying to construct a building. You haven't started business, but there is a delay and that person says, sorry for the inconvenience. I'm going to give you some money just to make you feel better. Goodwill payment. Is it taxable? You see, both involves the act of you receiving money, but for different purposes. In the first example, 
is payment because of the delay and because you can't make money. In the second example, yes, there's delay, but this payment is for goodwill. Do you have to pay tax? Now, tax law is very interesting. Judges have said in England, in a very old case called Edward, if you receive this compensation because it is to fill a revenue gap, it is because you can't make a, uh, you can't earn revenue during that period, then that particular compensation is taxable. I'll give you one case flow example because we all are law students. The Edward case is a case where the owner of the taxpayer owns a jetty. Okay. And they operate this jetty, they earn a living from this jetty, an income from this jetty operations. One day, an oil tanker missed their direction and came and collided with the jetty. They hit the jetty. The jetty was destroyed. And the jetty needs to be rebuilt. So the jetty owner, the taxpayer, claimed insurance payment for the destruction to the jetty. And the first question in court was, do they have to pay tax on this insurance money to reconstruct the jetty? God said, no, this is not income. This is compensatory payment to rebuild the asset. It is not taxable. Very good. Second payment came from the oil tanker owner. Because they were so negligent, they were also sued. The jetty owner sued them and got compensated for loss of income. Because for during the construction of the jetty, they can't make any money. During that period, I lose income. And the jetty, the oil tanker owner was made to pay compensation for loss of income to the jetty owner. Court said that is taxable because that payment is to plug the income loophole. That is income. Then you don't pay tax on your total income. You pay tax after deducting expenses. What amounts to expenses? The law is very general law under section 33, subsection 1. Any expense or outgoing which you incur wholly and exclusively for the production of income is taxable. A very good case law I can illustrate to you is a case that I did in court not too long ago, the Mercedes-Benz case. To promote their cars, Mercedes-Benz used to throw events to launch the car. And at these launches, you will have celebrities who will come and sing a song, will entertain the guests, there will be a lot of food and drinks. And the Inland Revenue Board said, this blunder, these expenses are not deductible because taxpayer is in the business of selling cars. Why are they hosting parties? There's no need to go and host these parties. Mercedes-Benz said, I host these parties to sell my car. I promote my car, I profile my car. And these parties attract my potential customers. I call singers, I serve them food, I serve them drinks because the target customers are professionals, high network individuals. And to bring them here, I have to throw a nice party, a nice event to attract people. Therefore, I need to incur these expenses. Court held, these are all deductible expenses because court said whether the expense is required or not, look from the taxpayer's perspective and not from the tax department's perspective. If a taxpayer wants to be creative in selling his business, of course, those are all deductible expenses. Friends, business flows or evolves with circumstances, just like this webinar. Had you told me three months ago, I'll be here giving a webinar, I would have laughed at that idea. But today, it has become the new norm for us to tune in and listen from our phone or from our laptop or from our iPad, uh, all these webinars, uh, asking questions through the q &A box, the new norm. Businesses evolve in that manner as well. That is why Mercedes has been able to run and been in the world for more than 100 years. Evolution is necessary for business. Therefore, business expenses also evolve. And finally, the other key expense for businesses would be allowances. When I use the term allowances, I'm referring to capital allowance, industrial building allowance, reinvestment allowance, and investment tax allowance. These are allowances whereby the taxpayer incurs the money to build something or to buy a machine. 
those expenses can get allowances. These kind of expenses do not qualify for deduction because this is what we call as capital expense. But the law allows in certain circumstances for taxpayers to claim capital allowances or industrial building allowances. If you expand or modernize your business, you get to claim reinvestment allowance. If you do a promoted activity or you undertake to manufacture a promoted product, the government gives you investment tax allowance. So these are allowances available when you go and incur large sums of money to start your business or to grow your business. So that gives us an idea as to key basic principles. You just have to remember four things. Tax statute to be read strictly. Taxable income only if it is derived from Malaysia or accrued in Malaysia. It must be within the classes of income. Number three, what are deductible expenses? Any expense you'd incur wholly and exclusively to produce income. That includes throwing a party if you want to promote your product. And finally, there are various allowances available if you want to go and build a factory or you want to renovate your factory or you want to go and buy machineries. So these are the basic principles of tax law. Let's go to the next slide. When you do all these things, the IRB, the Inland Revenue Board, would want to know, do you have a basis? Boleh ke? They claim all these allowances. Betul ke? Income dia tak banyak. So to do all those things, the IRB has power to ask for information and documents. Yeah, they have fairly wide powers to ask for this information such as bank statements, your assets under your name and your wife's name or your children's name. For the young ones, of course, you don't have wife and children yet. But in the future, uh, these are the things they can ask you. They can ask you for your ledger. They can ask you for your invoices. They can ask you for your receipt books. IRB has also power to enter and search your premise. And they can also call you for questioning. Now, when they call you for, when they want to come and do a search on you, uh, they, they must come during reasonable hours and they must cooperate with you. You have a right to be there. You have a right to see what they, what they search and you have a right to have all the items seized from you to be listed neatly before you sign the, the form to acknowledge the seizure notices. When you're being questioned by the IRB, you got the same power. You may have your tax agent or your lawyer next to you but IRB can ask your tax agent to leave. <coughs> but can the IRB ask your lawyer to be removed or not to be allowed to be in the meeting room? <coughs> I go through that very often when IRB doesn't allow my client uh, to allow me to be in the room to answer, uh, to help them uh, with the questioning. I generally take the view the IRB has no such powers and when the IRB does that, we can ask IRB to uh, you can leave the meeting room because the IRB has no power to prevent you from getting legal advice or having a solicitor being present next to you. Having heard about IRB, let's look at the next slide. What are obligations of taxpayer? Malaysia has the self-assessment system whereby you got to decide how much tax you got to pay. That is what I meant by determine your own tax liability. You also got to choose your own tax deductions. You got to choose your own tax relief. It's a very difficult task. You got to decide how much to pay and how much so-called relief can you get. You make mistake, that's your problem. IRB is not going to come and tell you you made a mistake by not claiming a tax incentive. You got to go and sort it out yourself. That is what is meant by self-assessment. But in making self-assessment, we have to be honest. There must be honesty in the way we want to pay taxes. Yeah, must jujurla. I guess honesty and integrity is a given thing in all in all aspects of life, including tax returns. We must file our tax returns and forms properly and in good time. I use the term properly because it's not mini, 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 mo. Gasa, fill up the form, suka, apa yang kita suka. No. When you enter your details, when you bubu the number, yeah, please make sure you do it properly. Think. Think first before you write something in the tax return and make sure you file them in good time within the time prescribed under the law. Okay? Retain all relevant documents. The law 
requires you to keep documents for a period of seven years. Please keep the documents. If your documents cannot be kept that long, because those documents, what they call, uh, especially when you get uh, papers, uh, where they call like the fax machine quality paper, they fade. Your receipts can fade. Please do a PDF and keep a dig digital copy. Yeah, or do a photocopy as well. And whenever IRB asks you to cooperate, when they want to come and search your house, when they want to question you, please give the full cooperation, but make sure that you only give cooperation to the extent required by the law. Okay? Not beyond what is required of the law. Okay? Now, next question. David, is everything clear at your end? Uh, yes, but we can't see your face, Good. Mr. Sarwana. You can't see my face? Okay. Yes. What do uh, you yeah. see? Oh, we can see now. Oh, we you can, can see, see now. me now. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So, let's go to the next slide. Because I was, I was looking at my, my PDF version of the slides. Okay, Lukman will go to the next slide and we will now see. Uh, remember, I ended by saying cooperate to the extent required by the law, right? When you go and give kerjasama, janganlah buta buta bagi kerjasama. Kerjasama setakat the law requires you to do it. Because on this slide, you will see at bullet point number three know your rights. No self-incrimination. Remember law students? You do not have to go and give evidence or any information that incriminates you. So when I say you bekerja sama with the, with the IRB, what the law requires you to do. Okay? If the law says this is your, your rights, you may choose to exercise your rights. So what IRB likes to do to taxpayer to make sure you tell the truth to make sure that you are declaring it correctly, they like to come and visit you for an audit or investigation. Now, whenever they want to come and visit you for an audit or investigation, you must make sure you identify potential issues, prepare supporting documents, know your rights, and obtain professional advice. You'd be wondering, Mr. Sara, how would I know? Dia belum melawat lagi. They haven't even come. How to identify? Is it like, Spotting exam questions lah, isn't it? Before you go for your exams, don't you spot? You also look at the notes, you also look at your lecture, you also dengar and you think, mm, I think these are the areas my lecturer are going to target. IRB pun sama juga. Yeah? You must go through your documents, your tax computations and your audited accounts and try to identify areas where IRB will try to come and target. Okay? Now, once you once you prepare, the next stage is, next slide, you will want to see what kind of tax audit and investigation can the IRB do. Number one, they can do a normal desk audit. That means, desk audit means they sit in their pajabat, they check on you. If when they check on you, they find everything is in good order, they leave you alone. But when they check you from the desk, they rasa sangsi, they think they have to come and speak further, they will come and do a field audit to you. Field audit means, they bukan pergi padang ya. Field audit means, they go and visit you at your home or at your office. They do lawatan to you. They write you a letter, they will tell you, kita nak datang melawat dalam masa dua minggu. Sediakan dokumen berikut. Are you with me or not? Okay? Now, if they come and audit you or they suspect they're quite naughty, they will do investigation against you. Investigation, they may not give you notice. This is lawatan mengejut. Ex-kolah lah, again, spot check. Yeah? Now, they have civil investigation, criminal investigation and amla investigation. What are these three investigations? Civil, they come and siasat you but they don't want to charge you in court. They only want to impose penalty. But criminal investigation means they intend to charge you, they intend to prosecute you in court. Whilst AMLA investigation means 
they got money laundering concerns with you. Okay, that means they want to make sure that you, uh, I have not done any of the AMLA offences. Now, what are AMLA offences? Not paying tax, tax evasion, yeah, not paying tax in the form of committing tax evasion, making incorrect returns, and not filing returns. All these can amount to AMLA uh, offences. Next slide, please. Okay, now, consequences of not paying tax. What happens if you don't pay your income tax? First, they will increase your tax by 10%. So if you hutang kerajaan 1 million and you don't pay it within 30 days, it becomes 1.1 million. Then they will sue the company as a recovery. A debt owed to the government. Then, if you still don't pay, they sue the directors and make the directors personally liable. And finally, they can also impose travel restriction on directors, but you can't leave Malaysia. Okay? So if the IRB does things to you and you're not happy, assuming they do an audit on you and they raise issues, yang bukan -bukan, you don't agree with the IRB. IRB comes to David and tells David, hey David, you know the, the scheme bantuan that they get from the government, we want to tax you lah. Okay? And David says, I remember listening to this Alsa talk where Mr. Saravanan said, Bantuan kerajaan is not income. How can you tax me? Grab income, you want to tax? Okay, tapi ini bantuan cannot be taxed. So, he's not happy. What can he do? The law gives him right of appeal. The law allows him to go to the special commissioners, which is the normal route of appeal. But if David says, this is completely not right, this is unconstitutional, this is illegal, then David can go to high court straight away and ask for judicial review. Okay? Judicial review is available in very limited circumstances in tax cases. This is especially when the IRB acts out of jurisdiction. One example of out of jurisdiction is when the income is earned abroad. Malaysia doesn't tax you for foreign source income. So IRB cannot tax you for foreign source income. Okay? So these are the few basic principles of tax law that I want to share with the listeners in this session today and I thought uh, a subject to moderator allowing it, David, uh, you are a moderator, uh, we could take some questions and I can answer those questions uh, so that our session becomes more interactive. Yes, um, thank you Mr. Sarwa. Sarwana. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, yes. Um yeah, thank you for your thank you for your thank you for your informative um presentations. Yes, and actually we have some questions from the floor. Yes. And most are like two or two of the questions they ask the similar thing, which is what is the general job scope of a tax lawyer? And what do they do with usually? With usually. Generally, this is to answer the anonymous attendee in uh, Jia Hua Ch Chen, I think Jia Hua. A tax lawyer, yes. we do what we call a hybrid practice. As of uh, myself, I speak for myself. I go to court. I argue tax disputes. I also do tax advisory where taxpayers come and ask me whether this particular transaction, uh, is there any tax concerns or not. I do a lot of restructuring work. At this MCO period, I do a lot of restructuring work where taxpayers we are restructuring their business and they come and ask me for tax advice. What is the best way to manage my tax affairs so that I pay the least amount of tax? That is called tax mitigation and the law allows you to do that. So the general scope is litigation and advisory. Okay. Yes. Um. So, um. I think I will. I I have a question, Mr. Sarawana. Sarawana. Because just now you mentioned about a tax agent. So, what is the difference between a tax lawyer and a tax agent? Giving advice. Giving advice. Generally, of course, tax agent will do a lot of compliance work and advisory work. Uh. But when it comes to interpretation of the law, uh, when there's a contentious issue, uh, generally, lawyers are consulted in such instances. Okay. I don't do yes. tax compliance work. I don't do tax filings. Okay. 
Yeah. Yes, then we we'll proceed to the next question, the next question which is, which is uh, what is the difference is between the, difference the tax evasion tax and the tax avoidance? tax avoidance? Tax evasion is criminal, is fraud. You go to jail for that. Section 114 of the Income Tax Act describes the various instances of conduct which can become tax evasion. Tax avoidance is not criminal, it is a civil matter whereby under section 140, if you do something artificially to avoid tax, the IRB can disregard your attempt and IRB can make you pay tax. That is the difference between evasion and avoidance. Evasion is fraud and is, is frowned upon, you shouldn't do that. Tax avoidance is where you look at various ways of trying to avoid tax when the law doesn't intend to give you the tax benefit. Okay, wow. Okay. wow. So, so, I think the, the I next question, which actually I would like to ask yeah, too, like to ask because too. just now in the slides, you mentioned, you mentioned about the IRB about will, will come to do the field check, check and also the, maybe, the tax, the, maybe the tax tax audit. Yes, tax audit. audit. Yes. So, normally how long normally does it take? take? Uh, I, I, an, an audit can take between three months to one year, depending on the nature of the audit and the size of the company. And how often the IRB will do, uh, it, generally people will say three years once, five years once, but if we evade tax every year, they'll come and audit you every year. Lah. Okay. Yes, and the next question is, do you have any recommendable, have any recommendable tax book tax for taxation, there, law? taxation law? There are many books in the market, uh, the, uh, depending what kind, to what extent you want to read. You can read Dr. Virender's book, you can read uh, Dr. Chong Kai Fat's book, you can read Dr. Arjunan's book, uh, Jaya Balan's book. Uh, my book uh, is a bit outdated, the new version is coming after the MCO. And, and uh, David, I, got, I just published a book online, 100 Queenies on Tax Law. Uh, oh, yes. uh, beginners can read that book. Uh, I'm more than happy to make it available to Alsa later. Okay, yes, thank you, Mr. Sarawana. We will hope, look forward for your next book, the new book, book also. Yes, and for the next question, what is your thoughts is your on the myth that uh, tax that lawyers tax make lawyers a lot of money? <laughs> lot of money. <laughs> uh, I... Uh, as a lawyer, you, uh, my, my only advice to you is you should not become a lawyer to make money. Yeah, that cannot be the motive. Of course, we work to make some money. We want to make money, good money, of course. But it cannot be a sole motive. Yeah? Because a, a person who becomes a lawyer purely to make money will end up doing things that are not so proper. Uh, like doctors, you know, is a noble profession. So money must be the secondary part. The first option must always be, the first criteria, the given thing, is to act with integrity and honesty. And number two, to always uphold justice. And that means the law. Then, when you do these two things, money will come to you. Of course, the highest paid lawyers in England are tax lawyers. Uh, highest paid barristers are tax barristers. Uh, I'll be honest and say that was one of the reasons why I became a tax lawyer. Uh, in RDS, uh, I'm sure many law students know, uh, the, besides tax, uh, we will do litigation and corporate work, but tax is the main pillar of our practice and we are the highest paying law firm now. Uh, yes, uh, you can make some good money in tax law, uh, but it is a demanding area like any other area of the law. Uh, so if you work very hard and, and apply your mind, think out of the box, I'm sure uh, whatever area of the law you do, you will make good money. Okay, yes, okay, thank you, yes. Mr. Sarwana. That is a very great uh, advice, especially for those students who are going to graduate soon. Yes, um, well, for the next question, if I decide to be a tax lawyer, can I choose to do litigation only or compliance work? Either. Generally, lawyers don't do compliance work. I, mean, I don't do compliance work. I guess there are lawyers out there who can and do uh, compliance. I don't know many. Uh, you can, of course, do only litigation. Uh, if your clients engage you and you do litigation, sure, uh, you can do litigation. I, I like to do both because when I do my advisory work, I'm able to give uh, the pitfalls that my clients must avoid. Therefore, I end up doing advisory work, restructuring work as well. So there's a combination of litigation 
uh, and advisory is up to you. I, I know what you want to do and what the market uh, engages you for. All right. All right. And for the and next question, I think we have already answered this yeah. about the tax books. About the tax books. And then we jump to the next question. Yeah, a lot of non-law accountancy out there. How do you set yourself yourself apart from them? Non-law firms don't go to court. We go to court. That is the key distinction. Yes. Yeah, I think that's. It's similar to the questions that I asked you just now, right? What is the difference? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what what is the so advice that you would give to the junior practitioners, practitioners who are interested in Pegamatism? I don't know what is meant by, that means are you in practice or not in practice. If you are a law student, you are most welcome to apply for internships. Uh, I would advise uh, students to start pupillage in tax, uh, be very clear, and then uh, go into practice immediately with tax law. Uh, in, in For me, I generally only take, uh, retain, I only keep with me, uh, my pupils to practice law with me. Uh, I've stopped taking lateral hire from bar to do tax law uh, because I think, uh, you know, sometimes you need to move very quickly and, and so on. So, but if you're a junior practitioner uh, who's already in practice, it's never too late, uh, but you need to go and pick up a good book and you need to go and then uh, answer some uh, and try to get some work. But remember, the, the challenge you will have is tax involves money. Yeah? And, and only the big cases go to court. And that's where the, 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 the businessmen are very reluctant to come and engage uh, a junior or someone with no tax background. So maybe you may want to then work with a senior uh, who does tax and try to learn the ropes from them. Okay, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Yeah, and I think the next question is kind of interesting. Quite interesting. Because a lot of us now is like selling online, doing online, business, online, business, online, business, online business during this MCO. So is this so is the this income generated from this online business taxable? Taxable? Yes. Of course. Makes no difference whether you sell from a shop or whether you sell from online. It is taxable income. Okay. Okay. There is no difference. Is no as long as that is income, as as that is income it you is pay taxable, tax. Right? Taxable, yes. Right? yes. Okay. Um, so for, um, the next so question, for the next question, we have the three have questions, from, three Douglas. questions from Douglas. Uh, the first, what are the uh, chances are the of success chances in general, for judicial, general for judicial review on tax issues? On tax issues? Douglas, the chances all depends on how good, the, the, how good you craft how good you craft the legal issue on point for judicial review. What is so special about your case that it has to go for judicial review? Those factors will be the one of the first factor. Number two, of course, advocacy in court. Uh, to what extent do you persuade judge to rule in your favor? Uh, these are the factors you must go and look at. A good case to read is the case of Magnum. Lawan Ketua Pengarah Asir Dalam Negeri, a case that I did with my senior partner, Dr. Naben, in 2017 or 2018. That's a good case to go and read to see why judge granted leave for judicial review in that case. Okay. Yes. okay. So for the second question, so second question, can you explain the tax explain investigation, the tax process, investigation process, process in detail? They will write you a letter, Douglas. Uh, they will come and visit you. They will spot check on you. Then they will never tell you they're going to do an investigation on you. They turn up on your at your office or home and they say, listen, we want to investigate you and they will then look and search your house for documents and, and search your house for money or jewelry that you have and then ask you to account for it. Uh, and then if you are unable to account, then prima facie, they will say you have evaded tax, you got illegal income or, you know, income that you've not declared. And that is why you got all this kind of wealth or all these assets, all these cars, you know, and they'll ask you to pay taxes on that. So that is how the investigation process starts. And sometimes the IRB do surveillance on you, uh, either on your own, you become person of interest, or there is somebody tipping off the IRB about you, uh, that you are not paying taxes. And who are these people? I can tell you, your best friend who become your no more best friend, your ex-wife, your ex-girlfriend, your ex-secretary and your ex-employees. And people you go and annoy. If they know things about you, they know dirt about you, they go to the tax department and they give solid information, 
the IIB will come and knock on your door. Okay. Yes. Um. So, yes, Mr. Um, Sarawana, I think your answer your for these second questions second also question answer the third question questions, answer right? questions, right? Illegal about income is taxable. Yes. Yes. So whether the illegal whether income the is illegal taxable, income income in taxable in Malaysia. Taxable in Malaysia. Uh, make a pardon. What's the question, uh, David? I think I've answered all the three questions. Um, there is another. Um, um the third another, question um, is the the illegal uh, income. Whether it is yeah, taxable. It is taxable. taxable. It is taxable in Malaysia. Okay. okay. Yes. Um. Yes. So um, we jump so to the next question. To the next question. Um. Do you mind to share mind uh, to with share us the most interesting, the most interesting tax interesting dispute that you have you handled have before? Handled before. Sure. And so what uh, I have to take a bit of water. I'm sorry to my Muslim friends. Now, um, <laughs> there's, I I have about eighty reported cases in total that they we counted. We did we did we have done nearly four hundred plus disputes in court tax cases. You know, of the most interesting case to talk about, huh? Uh, the case would be the case of Plangi. Sorry, a Metacorp development. Metacorp development. The first judicial review case in Malaysia for tax where we were successful. Where we argued successfully that the land that was compulsory acquired from the taxpayer was the developer. The compensation was not taxable. Metacorp makes the principle that not all income is taxable in Malaysia very clear. And after we won the case at the High Court, Court of Appeal and the Federal Court leave uh, was not granted to the IRB. Uh, the IRB was then forced to amend the Income Tax Act and introduce Section 4, Capital C to amend the law. So that is a very special case for me. And uh, David, that is the first case uh, that I did and, and eventually made me a partner uh, in the previous firm of mine. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. yes, okay. Mr. Sarawana. Okay. Um, then the next question the next is, question uh, will you say uh, will you being say a tax lawyer a requires tax a good lawyer, mathematical or financial or knowledge, financial background? knowledge background? Of course it helps. You need to have a mathematical mind, you know. If you have a mathematical mind, you analyze things better. Because when you look at the audited accounts or when the accountant speaks to you, uh, you know, that, that, that language... You understand the language. Otherwise, it can be a bit difficult. Okay. Yes. Um, Mr. Sarawana, actually, Sarawana, we received quite a lot of questions. Quite a lot of questions. Um, do you um, want... Because you the want, time is going to up, up soon. I, I can spend another 10 minutes. No problem. Okay. Yes. Okay, then we will continue, yes, the we'll continue the questions. So do you, the next question is, do you the think there is, there is there any lacuna, there is any lacuna, in, the lacuna in the income tax law? Income tax law? Yeah, of course, that, that's how we lawyers make a living. Our job is to go and find lacuna in the law so that our client gets the best, uh, uh, what you call, outcome, isn't it? Otherwise, you won't make a living. Uh, but what you call, um, what I wanted to say is, the court's approach is, depending on the judge we get, uh, some judges prefer straight away to look at uh, a literal approach. Some judges want to go and look at purposive approach. Uh, but it all depends on the circumstances that we have and on the type of law and the type of lacuna you are looking at. So it's a mixed approach. Christina, mixed approach. They apply literal approach in some cases. Uh, if you go and look, read the most recent case of Abdul Halim, uh, Lawan, uh, Suruan Jaya, Syarikat Malaysia, dan Ketua Pengarasi Dalam Negeri, there the court looked and took literal approach. But if you go and read the case of um, apa ni, uh, Positive Vision, court took the purposive approach. So courts, you know, take different approaches. Okay. So there will be a mixed so approaches. Mix approaches. Okay, so okay, for the so next question, what are the pros and cons, the cons of practicing, cons tax, law practicing tax law in a big firm, in uh, a big firm uh, and a and small a firm? Small firm. Well, I was in a large law firm before and I've set up my own law firm. Uh, we are now growing. We want to be one of the biggest law firms. But I tell you, my dear friend, it's not about big or small. First is yourself. You must have the determination to become a very good lawyer 
and number two you must get a very good mentor a very good master uh, i am very privileged uh, that i was tutored by dr dp naben uh, who still is my senior partner uh, he has been at the bar for more than 40 years uh, so i've learned a lot from someone of that vintage and the second person who taught me a lot is ichi rosi dahlan uh, i call him the legendary rosli uh, and he has been at the bar for more than 30 years and 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 for, for these two people there is no such thing called a difficult or impossible case the fighting power is that perseverance and i think that is what you must look for what is that you want to achieve size does not matter my dear friend because you can be in a small law firm and get a very good master yet be in a big law firm and get a master who may not you know relate to what you want to achieve so be careful when you want to choose a master uh, get get someone who you can relate to and someone who understands what you want to achieve Yes, that is a very good that advice. Very good advice, uh, Mr. Sarawana. Mr. Sarawana. So, um, so as, um, you as you mentioned, your firm is the highest firm paying the firm, highest firm in Malaysia <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you deal so with the pandemic and also the MCO? Because you are paying a lot of money to your employees. We are recruiting people. We are now going to start the second round of recruitment. We are doing well. No issues. Uh, whenever there is a challenge, you must look for the opportunities, David. Uh, life is like that uh, mco and and covid is not going to end us uh, i don't know whether you all know i was a covid patient i am covid patient number 53 i didn't give up in in hospital i fought it and after 8 days i got discharged and here i am working so always be positive and we lawyers you want to be a lawyer you must have perseverance right and and we have worked so hard in law school uh, we have worked so hard to get into our universities so nothing is going to stop us from being successful we have taken the position not to reduce anyone's salaries in our firm because we we value talent and good talent must be remunerated fairly because we all got financial commitments i can't answer for other law firms uh, dear friend uh, everyone have their own circumstances uh, in in rds our philosophy is we are a family and we will stick together and we want to make sure none of our sal- employees uh, salary is reduced or deducted during the mco period or after mco period oh cool. that is so great, that is so, great. so mr so, sarawana uh, david, if, I add, if i may david if yes, i may yes, add yes. Uh, if you are a law student and you are graduating and you finished your bar or clp or you don't have you are a local graduate you got yourself a first class or a very high 21 with 3.6 cgp and above please apply because you're looking for good people now all right all right thank you thank you mr sara thank you mr sara uh, so there is uh, another so question is from another justin question lau from justin lau do you know any tax you know lawyer any in tax lawyer east malaysia malaysia and there are no uh, tax lawyers in east malaysia justin uh, lawyers in in east malaysia uh, because of the nature they mix practice Uh, but they they do, do they do cases on a ad hoc basis yes okay so okay. the next so question what is your general is view your on general wealth view and also inheritance, and also inheritance tax? tax we don't have it in malaysia uh, inheritance tax has been abolished long ago uh, there were some rumors that malaysia may want to reintroduce in inheritance tax but no i don't think so and if you look at the oecd study uh, wealth and inheritance tax is not does not mean we're going to collect more money so i i my view is we we shouldn't waste time with this kind of archaic taxes we might as well collect tax from digital economy and e-commerce okay so we're go- we're coming to the end soon to the end soon uh when you mention oh, when foreign, foreign sources foreign income, sources income what, are what are the examples of this type of income type of income uh it all depends where you get the money from uh uh, uh it uh, the test is if you go and 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 do grab food in singapore it is not it is foreign source income but if you do grab food in malaysia it's malaysian source income so the test is what was done to earn the income in question and where was it done oh okay oh. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. But it depends on the countries that you earn the money, right? Earn the money, right? Yes. 
Okay. So the next question is, so since question not all the law schools provide law tax, schools law subject, tax law subjects, which subject do you which encourage to study encourage before to practicing, study practicing tax, law? tax law? Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm afraid they, there's no equivalent of tax law, my dear friend. Uh, so you, you, if you like trust law and land law, you may like tax law. It's very dry. You like land law. If land law is dry, if you like land law, there's a possibility you may enjoy tax law. Okay, so do you provide internship in learning the process of tax law proceedings? Yes, we do. We do. Uh, uh, we, have, we, we, you know, we are only going to start. We wanted to start in uh, in July, uh, but because of the MCO, you know, we we, we have to delay. But I hope MCO is lifted soon, then we can start uh, internships. Okay. Yes. Um, do we have property gain have tax, property tax in Malaysia? We have real property gains tax in Malaysia only, can I guess, uh, in a very limited scope. Only when you dispose of properties and real property shares. Otherwise, we don't have general gains tax in Malaysia. Okay. okay. Mm. Next question from Next Anonymous Tanti. How do law How firms do usually law mitigate firms the amount of tax the they, amount have of tax they have to pay? Uh, you, know, you, can, you, you know, there is no, you can't mitigate much because your expenses are very limited in a law firm. Uh, a very good law firm that is well managed should aim to have at least 60% profit. So your expenses are deductible. So that could be uh, what you call books, you know, that could be salaries of your staff. That's why be generous, yeah? Uh, pay people well. So, you know, otherwise you end up paying more taxes. And and perhaps send your colleagues, your lawyers for trainings, you know, for talks. All those things are expenses where the law firm can incur if they want to reduce the amount of tax they want to pay. Okay, so do you recommend any legal database which is the best to use for researching tax matters? All, all databases are good, so I don't recommend any particular database that looks like I'm marketing for them. If they sponsor your event next time, David, I'll promote that a good database for you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Sarawana. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, um, my time is running um, up. Okay, so do you want to take the last question? Take the last question? Okay. Okay, so a scenario, a scenario if my bank account is used by my family members to give an amount of money, but this amount of money is instantly transferred back to this family member who is going to pay the tax income. First, you can't use your account for family members here. I think under banking laws, uh, it is an offense to allow your, ba your bank account to be used by another person. So that's the first thing you need to remember, yeah? Uh, so uh, if the money comes to your account, you need to justify to the income tax department uh, whether it's your income or not. Uh, if it is if it regarded as your income, you got to pay tax. Yeah, or at least commission. So so don't do this because I don't, yeah, it doesn't sound like a good scenario for you. Okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, that... Uh, David, uh, mm -hmm. David, let me just... Uh, quickly answer all the certain questions I have uh, so that you don't have to read it out to me in the interest okay, of yes. time. Okay, yes. uh, tax res resource, you know, I've already answered all are good resources. Compensation received on damaged goods are they not generally taxable? Uh, well, it can be taxable if it results in loss of income for you. Uh, if you look at section 22, subsection uh, 2, uh, certain payments in the form of compensation, uh, recoupment, recovery, reimbursement, insurance or otherwise are taxable. So, uh, mindful of that. This is someone trying to oh, try to catch out me here, yeah? asking me thoughts on, on my former law <laughs> firm. Well, I take a different view. We subscribe different views. And anyway, the matter is pending uh, in dispute resolution now. So, it's not appropriate for me to comment. La, yeah? Now, hi, Saravana. Any advice finding pupillage? I know it's a difficult time. Uh, I, I, that's why in RDS, we decided to take in more pupils. Uh, because we are a firm, one of our four founding goals is to uh, nurture young talent. And leaving to that particular uh, goal of ours, we are now looking for people to, to apply. And I'm glad Alsa gave me this opportunity and I hope to receive good uh, uh, applications. YouTubers, uh, of course, it's taxable. If your server is based in Malaysia and YouTuber is based in Malaysia, you produce the content in Malaysia, you got to pay tax. Why do you enjoy tax law? 
for some reason, I don't know why, I like numbers and uh, and I like tax because it's a very dry area, doesn't have much emotion. Hence why I end up using, I end up uh, reading uh, tax law. Okay, Leonard, Leonard, I have already answered. Uh, when you say forex income, you mean trading in forex? If you're trading it in Malaysia, of course, it's taxable income. David, that, that calls it a day. And, and yes. thank you so much for all the questions. So many questions, man. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yes. So since we have already finished the Q&A sessions, and then um, I thank you so much for Mr. Sarawana for your time, for your precious time to answer all these questions and to share your thoughts uh, on Malaysian tax law. So do you want to give a uh, wrap up for this uh, today's seminar? The last wrap up. Just to see your dreams. Don't let all this MCO and this pandemic to dampen you. Don't be negative. This is not the first time the world is going through a difficult period. Malaysia has gone through the 84-85 commodity crisis. Malaysia has gone through the 97-98 economic crisis. So we are still here, still strong and still alive. Malaysians are resilient people. So, I mean, it will be difficult. You may not get the money you want. But you cukup makan lah, you know, you will get your food on your table. Be grateful for that opportunity and, and give us a few years. And I'm sure things will come back to the norm, to the normal. Normality will come, business will pick up. And I'm sure we'll make money when the time comes. Yes. Thank you, David. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarawana, for a piece of advice. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again for our yes. attendees for our also attendees for joining our, joining our, our uh, webinar today. Our webinar today. Hopefully we can have visit Star Romana again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.